let's let's uh let's get started here i want to welcome everyone um to another one of our wednesday lunchtime seminar series with the new voices in global security my name is dr amanda chisholm and i'm a senior lecturer at the school of security studies and i'm also the chair of um, this new voices series uh, to, today, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Lyndon Burford speak on his recent authored report and broader research on blockchain technology and nuclear disarmament. The title of Dr. Burford's presentation is Trust the Machine, Blockchain and Nuclear Disarmament and Arms Control Verification. And this paper considers blockchain is best known as the technology that underpins Bitcoin but it also has a vast array of existing and potential uses in areas such as finance, communications, security, trade, manufacturing, medicine, and transport. At its core, blockchain is a peer-to-peer -peer networking technology uh, that allows participants to transact, or transact and store encrypted data in a highly tamper-resistant way by giving participants very high confidence in the veracity of the shared data, blockchain creates a technical foundation for cooperation amongst parties that otherwise have no basis for trusting each other without the need for a central authority or, a authority or intermediary. And this has led to its nickname of the trust machine. So for several years, researchers have been exploring the potential for blockchain to increase the efficiency and effectiveness of international safeguards to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. Uh, in this talk, Lyndon will explore the flip side of that coin. He asks, can blockchain help streamline and strengthen multilateral processes to verify the dismantlement of existing nuclear arsenals? And he will answer that question in this presentation. So Dr. Linda Burford is a postdoctoral research associate in the Center of Science and Security Studies here at King's College London, where he studies the theories, technologies, and policies of nuclear deterrence, arms control, and disarmament. His PhD looked at the relationship between national identity and nuclear disarmament policy in Canada and New Zealand. In 2015, he was an advisor to the New Zealand government delegation at the review conference of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. And in 2011, he won the McAlvany Prize um, from the James Martin Center for Nonproliferation Studies for his essay on user pays model for nuclear risk reduction. Dr. Burford is joined here um, by Mr. William Alberg, who will also act as his discussion. Uh, Mr. Alberg has served as the director of NATO's Arms Control, Disarmament, and WMD Nonproliferation Center since 2017. Prior to that, he served as the head of the NATO Arms Control and Coordination Section starting in 2012. William has worked on arms control, nonproliferation, and safeguard issues since 1994. In the 1990s, he worked for the IAEA safeguards and on improving the security of Russian nuclear weapons related facilities as part of the Nun Luger program. He then joined the Defense Threat Reduction Agency in 2000, working on strategic planning, arms control, and small arms light weapons. He then served as the DOD Treaty Manager for Arms Control before moving to the State Department to support the 2010 MPT Review Conference. He returned to the Pentagon in 2011 to direct European arms control policy and work on chemical biological defense and global WMD nonproliferation. In his spare time, which actually doesn't sound like a lot, William has also managed to publish. Um, some of his publications include the N, uh, NPT and the origins of NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements, substantial combat forces in the context of NATO-Russian relations, and a joint collaboration um, paper with NATO Defense College with Regan Nakason correspondence and its influence, or influence on the INF Treaty, which is forthcoming. So I want to thank you both very much for sharing your insights and expertise on this fascinating and timely topic. I've asked Lyndon to speak for about 20 minutes and then William, the floor is yours to discuss, offer some reflections before we open up the space to you, the wider audience for questions. As usual, um, can you please raise your Zoom hand if you want to ask a question live or place a question in the chat box and I'll read it out loud for Lyndon to respond to. So without further ado, Lyndon, I'm handing the floor over to you. Great, 
Thank you so much, Amanda. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, so I hope you will all have uh, my slide up there. Yeah, you've got that up, Amanda. Grand. So, yeah, first of all, um, thanks very much all for joining and, and a big thank you to Amanda for, for putting together this series, for inviting me to speak and to the King's team for, for supporting that. And also, William, um, thanks very much. It's fantastic to have you here. This, this report is actually, um, William and I have been discussing this topic of blockchain and arms control verification for, for like a year and a half. And so it's pretty exciting to uh, have finally published the paper. And, and, and I'm just very grateful to have uh, William's expert input um, okay. to, to feedback on it here today. So thanks, thanks both. So, uh, as Amanda said, today I'm going to be um, sharing the, the findings of this report, Blockchain on Blockchain and Nuclear Disarmament and Arms Control Verification. But just to put that in context, um, this is part of a broader project that I've been working on here at the Centre for Science and Security Studies for the last couple of years, um, led by Dr. Heather Williams. And that uh, project has been looking at ways to bring together a diverse range of stakeholders in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So, nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states, um, civil society, and look for opportunities to build cooperation uh, and ultimately to build trust in the other stakeholders and in the treaty regime as a whole. So that's just a, a, a broader piece of context for the paper. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today, I'll, I'll, I'll present this um, paper in, in sort of three sections. So in the first section, I'll introduce the context and the specific policy problem that I'm, that I'm looking to address. Uh, and in that regard, I would say that this is, is a more technical and conceptual paper. So it's, it's not political. I don't get into the politics of disarmament and arms control, which, of course, are critical issues in their own right. <clears throat> In the second section, I will talk about uh, specifically what blockchain is and why I think it matters in this context. And I'd, I'd flag at the outset that this is really building on some fantastic research that's being done uh, in the safeguard space. So in terms of IAEA safeguards to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, um, there's some great research on the application of blockchain in that field coming out of the Stanley Center, the Stimson Center, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in the United States. Um, and great to see uh, Cindy on the call as well from, uh, from Stimson. Uh, um, Cindy's been very helpful and, and, and very generous in, in feeding back on an earlier draft of this as well. Uh, and equally in Australia, uh, the University of New South Wales. So I'm, I'm building on that and I'm saying, how can that research inform what we do in the area of arms control and disarmament? And then third, I'll look at some specific applications uh, of blockchain in, or potential applications of blockchain in disarmament and arms control and talk about why I think uh, it would be a useful uh, field to explore more. So for those of you who are, who are busy and don't have a lot of time, I won't leave you hanging. I'm going to give you the, my bottom line up front, and that is that in this report, what I argue is that blockchain offers significant opportunities to um, increase practical cooperation to reduce nuclear risks through disarmament and arms control, and in particular, by strengthening and increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of the management of data. Uh, in disarmament and arms control processes. So I argue that blockchain can, can increase the efficiency and effectiveness of, those, effectiveness of those processes, but also that it can enable new types of verification data and process. And ultimately, that it can help to increase trust in verification data and trust in the process of disarmament verification overall. And as a result, that it can help to build trust and cooperation among uh, NPT parties and non-members. So, uh, turning to this question of the, the context and policy problem that, that I'm addressing here. So, the broader context is the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty signed in 1968, entered into force in 1970, um, also known as the NPT. So, the, uh, the, the NPT is the political and legal foundation of a global regime that seeks to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and also work towards the elimination of nuclear weapons and to share the benefits of the peaceful uses of nuclear technology. So the context that I'm writing this paper in is that we appear to have a stall. So the disarmament progress that we saw at the end of the Cold War has come to an end. Um, reductions in weapon numbers have been very significant, but those reductions have now all but stopped. And in fact, what we see is that the nine nuclear armed states are all either 
modernizing their nuclear arsenals, increasing the size of their nuclear arsenals, or extending the life of their nuclear arsenals for up to 50 more years. Now, in that context, um, there is a growing consensus among experts. It's, it's not unanimous, but there is what I would argue is a growing consensus that the risks around nuclear weapons are rising. And, and when I say risks are rising, what I mean is that the risk of the use of nuclear weapons uh, is increasing. And I would argue that the use of nuclear weapons would be the, um, I have presenter view on, awesome. <laughs> Thanks for that, Amanda. Does that change things? Uh, okay, Zoom, awesome, love you. Uh, so, um, that the uh, the use of nuclear weapons is the most likely um, cause or trigger of a nuclear war, which of course would be devastating for all of humanity and we would like to avoid. And so as a result, all countries have a shared interest in reducing that risk. So just to give you one example of, of that, the UK House of Lords uh, produced a report in 2019, uh, and I'm going to quote the, the very first sentence from the summary of that report, and I quote, the risk of the use of nuclear weapons has increased in the context of rising interstate comp competition, a more multipolar world, and the development of new capabilities and technologies, end quote. Uh, so in that context, uh, I would say that all states share an interest in preventing the use of nuclear weapons or reducing nuclear risks. And one way that they can do that is through cooperative arms control and disarmament. So, uh, at the same time, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty actually makes all members responsible for nuclear disarmament. But of course, non-nuclear weapon states that are, that are members of that treaty cannot undertake tangible disarmament. So how can they fulfill those obligations to, to support disarmament? And so one way that countries have been looking to try and do this is through verifying the dismantlement of nuclear warheads. Uh, so the International Partnership Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, uh, and um, the Quad Initiative are two examples of that, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the presentation. But just to say, those initiatives are already looking at ways that countries, nuclear armed states and non-nuclear armed states, can collaborate to uh, verify the dismantlement of nuclear warheads, which has not been achieved before. And the question that I'm addressing in this paper is, so that process generates an enormous amount of data, um, verification, inspections, um, declarations from nuclear armed states, um, environmental monitoring. And so the question is, what do we do with that data? How do we use that data with maximum transparency to increase trust in the process at the same time as protecting the integrity and the secrecy around that data so that non-nuclear weapon states are not getting access to proliferation sensitive information? Now, what I argue in this paper is that the attributes of blockchain correspond very closely to those challenges. And therefore, I think that the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, the Quad and other measures should incorporate blockchain into their research programs. So ultimately, the aim of this paper is to seek to encourage cooperation amongst NPT states and, and even non-members to reduce nuclear risks and to, to build trust. What I aim to do is to flip the script in terms of that we hear a lot of bad news about how new technologies are increasing risks, increasing the potential for conflict, et cetera. And so what I've done here is said, okay, well, where is an example of a technology that might do the opposite, that might enable us to increase cooperation to reduce risks? So turning to this more technical question of what is blockchain? So uh, ultimately, blockchain is a data management tool. It enables high security collective management of data, uh, which enables a network of authorized participants to transact and store data in a, in a highly secure way that enables them to maintain very high confidence in the integrity of that data. So to do that, blockchain creates a permanent encrypted record of, of data transactions. Uh, it does this without a central authority. So it uses effectively peer-to-peer -peer technology. So there's no one centralized storehouse of the data. It's spread across the network and I'll come back to the relevance of that point in the context of disarmament uh, a little later. Uh, blockchain creates a shared data ledger. And so that is effectively what is called the blockchain. The blockchain is the shared ledger. And finally, uh, experts often describe uh, 
one of the attributes of a blockchain as being practically immutable. What that means is that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to tamper with a blockchain in secret. So if you are one of the most powerful countries in the world and you dedicate an enormous amount of, of computing power and money and time, you might be able to alter the blockchain, but it's extremely likely that if you do, every other member of the network will immediately uh, be notified of that change. So it's very hard to cheat the process. And of course, that's critical for increasing trust in a disarmament verification context where there's always concern that other parties might be trying to cheat the process, for example, to make a declaration and then divert material or to make a declaration and then change it subsequently. And blockchain makes that practically impossible. So to just touch on a few reasons how, uh, sorry, a few of the ways that blockchain does these things. So blockchain is actually a combination of existing technologies of varying degrees of maturity. So one of those, as I mentioned, is distributed storage. So there's no centralized authority. And of course, what that does is it reduces single points of failure. So unlike Amazon Web Services or, or Google, where you have a central storehouse that can alter the data secretly, there is none of that in a blockchain. And so that reduces technical vulnerabilities to power failures or anything like that. But it also reduces vulnerabilities to insider threats or to adversary attacks because there's no central point to attack. You have to attack the entire blockchain at once. And so in order to effectively change data on a blockchain in secret, you'd have to hack every single node on the network at the same time and simultaneously change every copy of the blockchain spread across that network simultaneously. Uh, so another technology that blockchain incorporates is public key cryptography. Now, again, this is a decades old technology. It's relatively mature, although it's still very much developing. Uh, and I'm not going to go too much into the technical detail of this, but essentially what public key cryptography enables is for the users of a network to very strictly control who has access to what types of data and to what types of function on the network. Uh, so that enables them to verify that only authenticated users are on the network and only authenticated users are able to add data to the network, helping therefore to add confidence to the data on a blockchain. Third blockchain uses consensus mechanisms. So these are uh, a specialist algorithm that replaces the role of a central authority. So whereas previously you would have a central authority that um, takes all the incoming information and reconciles it to create a new updated ledger, the consensus mechanism does that instead. It very quickly and efficiently enables the network to come to agreement about the new state of a data ledger each time you add data to it. And then finally, uh, the process of hashing. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about this specific uh, process because this is critical to that um, attribute of blockchain, which is the immutability, it's practical immutability. So what is hashing? So uh, a hashing algorithm is a specialist algorithm that is what's called, excuse me, what it does is it enables you to encrypt data in a form that is impossible to reverse. So you run data through a uh, hashing algorithm, and at the other side, you get a short string of numbers and letters that is unique, that is irreplicable, and also cannot be reverse engineered. So you can't start with a hash of data and then reverse engineer the underlying data, or at least it's extremely, extremely difficult to do so. Um, so a hash represents the data on a blockchain, but it doesn't reveal the underlying data. Uh, a hashing algorithm is also deterministic. And what that means is if you take the same data and run it through the algorithm, you get the precise same hash out the other end every single time. And that enables uh, countries in a disarmament context to test that what countries are presenting as a true and accurate record of their declaration, et cetera, um, is exactly that because run it through the algorithm, now you get a certain hash, run it through the same algorithm in five years time, you're gonna get the exact same hash. So any changes uh, to data um, change the hash, so you can see if data has been changed. And hashing critically uh, creates an interlocking interdependency between blocks of data on a blockchain. So I'm just gonna talk through that very briefly. So let's say we start with two transactions in, in a disarmament process. So these might be uh, 
declarations of stockpile size, for example, from nuclear weapon states. So two different states have made these declarations. They've encrypted that data, so they are the only ones using their public key cryptography. They've encrypted it, so they are the only ones that can see the underlying data. So we take that encrypted data and we run it through a hashing algorithm and we get a hash for each algorithm. So that's just a short string of numbers and letters that's very quick to, and easy to identify and very quick and easy to uh, verify. So we take those two hashes and we hash them together. So now we've got one hash that represents the data from both of these encrypted declarations. We take that uh, hash of both transactions three and four and we add it to a block on the blockchain, let's say block two. So in block two, we've got this single hash that represents transactions three and four. And then we also add to block two a timestamp so we know exactly when the block was created. And we add the hash of block one. So we've taken all of the information from the previous block, we've hashed it, and then we've added that hash to block two. So now there's an interdependency between block two and block one. And of course, in block one, you've got all of the same things all over again. You've got a timestamp, you've got uh, a hash of the transactions that were stored in block one, and you've got the hash from the preceding block, hash zero. So you see how this interdependency is created. And then so now we've got block two, which is the, the green box. And so we take block two and we hash all of that data together again, and we create a hash for block two. We add the hash for block two into block three. We add a timestamp and a set of new transactions and so on and so on and so on. Now what this does is it creates uh, what I call a cascading interdependency between these blocks. So if you change even a single point of data, even a single bit in any one of these transactions along the way, you immediately create a cascading flow of changes across every single hash and therefore across every single block. And so what that means is that the network is able to verify if anyone has tried to change data, even if you can't see what the underlying data is. And that of course means that while the nuclear weapon states can see the underlying data of their verification um, declarations, non-nuclear weapon states who don't have access to the underlying data but do have the hashes, they will immediately be notified if anyone tries to change that data. And so it gives all of the stakeholders in the blockchain the ability to maintain very high confidence in that data. So look, I'm going to end my uh, PowerPoint there so that we, we don't have uh, death by PowerPoint. Um, but I'm just going to finish now with some discussion of how I think this applies in the context uh, of nuclear disarmament specifically. So I'm going to look at some specific use cases uh, for this, am I still sharing my screen? Where is my Zoom? No, I'm not. Okay, great. So, so turning to the uh, specific issue of uh, how this applies to blockchain. So as I said, there's been a lot of research done in nuclear safeguards. So in the report, I look at examples from the United States, Australia, and Finland, where public-private partnerships have, have actually built block blockchain prototypes to test how they would help to strengthen the integrity and confidence in IAEA safeguards. And all three of those public-private partnerships uh, that involve various research centers and government cooperation uh, concluded that blockchain does have the ability to add value here. And in particular, that this hashing process adds unique value over and above other digital um, digital tools for managing data, uh, for example, other forms of distributed ledger technology. Um, so taking that research and pulling it across into the context of uh, disarmament verification, in the report, I argue that blockchain could increase the efficiency and effectiveness of disarmament verification, for example, in increasing confidence in the data, reducing costs, and uh, strengthening the ability to rapidly detect any attempts to cheat the process, for example, by diverting nuclear materials out of the process. So I also argue that in addition to the ability to strengthen existing practices, there are areas in which blockchain can add new possibilities for verification data and uh, processes. So I'm very quickly just going to run through a few of those. So the first of these is the idea of a cryptographic escrow. So this is work that was done by Sebastian Philippe, Alexander Glaser, and Edward Felton. 
And so they argue that uh, it would be possible to for nuclear weapon states to make declarations up front. So, for example, uh, arsenal sizes or material holdings related to nuclear weapons. But using the hashing process and the encryption process, they make the declarations up front, but they don't reveal the underlying data. And then as the process progresses and they gain confidence in the good faith efforts of their negotiating partners, they're able to progressively reveal that data over time. Now, of course, that is not a process that's unique to blockchain, but where blockchain is unique is that because of the hashing process, as that data is revealed over time, the rest of the participants in the process and indeed the third party observers can verify with a very high level of confidence that the data that is being revealed over time is a precise match for the original data that was declared and hashed onto the blockchain. Uh, the second use case that I flag in this paper is the idea of a private internet of things made up of remote sensors to gather compliance and verification data, for example, at remote uh, facilities. So this would be, for example, a set of uh, environmental monitors, so either location data, um, uh, sorry, lo location data, um, environmental monitoring for particulate matter, um, things like that. So these sensors are getting smaller, cheaper, more reliable, and having a longer battery life. And so to give you an example of how this would work, you could take a set of location sensors, attach them to treaty accountable items such as warheads or weapon parts at, stored at a remote facility. Those sensors would be progressively or sorry regularly logging data on a blockchain and then using a thing called a smart contract so a smart contract is an algorithm that's that's encoded into a blockchain and a smart contract is encoded to automatically perform a pre-agreed function if a certain set of criteria are met so for example if those location sensors were found to have moved outside of a pre-agreed set of uh, physical boundaries so for example if that nuclear weapon state moved that a weapon component outside of a pre-agreed set of boundaries, that sensor would be automatically encoded to flag to the entire network. And so the entire network would immediately be um, uh, notified and that would enable, uh, um, that would enable uh, inspectors to, to go in and inspect and restore confidence in the process. So in that sense, the IoT, the private IoT would increase efficiency, reduce costs and enable the inspectors to really target their inspection activities where they're most useful. And then finally, the, the third case uh, that I talk about, which I mentioned before, is that bringing in non-nuclear weapon states as third party observers. So this is blockchain as an international confidence building measure because it's possible to share encrypted data and hashed data with non-nuclear weapon states those non-nuclear weapon states then become uh, stakeholders in verifying the ongoing integrity of that data. And so without having to see the underlying data, they can make sure that all parties to the agreement are fulfilling their obligations in good faith and are not trying to cheat the process. So to sum all of that up, uh, I'll go back to where I started. And that is to say that in this report, I argue that blockchain offers significant opportunities for practical cooperation among nuclear armed states and non-nuclear armed states to strengthen uh, the, the management of data relating to verification processes, uh, particularly to some arms control processes, but this technology could be applied more broadly to other weapons types. They offer the opportunity to strengthen existing practices to increase efficiency and effectiveness of those practices. But they also, sorry, blockchain also offers the ability to enable new types of verification data and processes and, and adds unique value in the hashing process in creating the practical immutable, uh, sorry, a practically immutable and permanent data record. So I recommend that uh, states that are involved in things like the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification or the Quad Initiative um, should take up this question and add blockchain to their research program. So thank you very much for your time and, and attention here. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, William and uh, very much look forward to hearing William's comments on this paper and to any questions that you in the audience might have. So thanks very much. Thanks for the great presentation. And um, I think this is really important. Uh, uh, Lynn and I were kicking this idea around at uh, Isidarko uh, almost two years ago now. Wow, time does fly when you're having a pandemic. 
for me, the question is how can this uh, contribute, especially on nuclear weapons disarmament? One of the biggest challenges we have in nuclear weapons disarmament is the very definition of a warhead. When is a warhead a warhead? And in a way, I think the blockchain um, technology provides us with an opportunity to address those problems very, very clearly. I'll have a couple of questions for you specifically, but, but what I wanna get at is, I think you outlined in your paper very well how you can build trust in a process that tracks an initial declaration, that tracks components in that declaration without giving away design information. Um, for, for warheads, you know, when a nation makes a declaration on warheads, you're talking about warheads that are made into delivery systems, ones that are at, at forward facilities, ones that are in central storage, ones that are in the hedge, and ones that are in the disarmament queue. So I think it's really clear that blockchain could do very well to trace warheads through that type of system without giving away uh, location information, which would be very important to the, to the possessor states, but would be able to, to trace when they go into the disarmament queue. The thing that I'm really interested in is how we go from the disarmament queue into the actual disposition of the material in the end. So can blockchain help me to um, trace uh, significant quantities, for instance, uh, IAEA defined SQ of HEU or plutonium uh, as it enters a warhead or as it leaves a warhead? Uh, can it trace it all through the process to being burned in a reactor? Um, because for me, that would be fascinating. Uh, again, I think it's clear that this can really help, and especially the idea with escrows, this can really help in terms of tracking a warhead from an active um, deployment arsenal to a hedge to a disarmament queue. Um, but the thing that we're really afraid of is that, you know, there's uh, thousands of warheads or hundreds of warheads in a, in a disarmament queue or a hedge queue that suddenly jump back into your active arsenal or things that you say that you've destroyed that you haven't really destroyed, that the plutonium is just being refurbished into new pits for warheads. So your initial declaration is going to be important. Tracking the components then, can you track the explosive, the high explosive element of the warhead? Can you track the physics package? Can you track the warhead casing, you know, all the different elements that go into making a warhead and then um, um, be able to have confidence that they're being destroyed. Um, and again, blockchain provides you, I think, with the opportunity to ensure that the design information is not given away at all. And I know you said that uh, in the report, you talk about how Australia and the United States looked at cheating and spoofing and hacking. And I think it's pretty clear that that's uh, handleable. So a couple of the questions then for you, uh, is there a possibility for information loss? In other words, not hacking per se, but is there a possibility of you giving away information through blockchain that you wouldn't want that the other side in analyzing all the data that you're giving in blockchain uh, is able to see things that they're not supposed to see, not even necessarily design information, but by carefully examining the transactions, can they decide something about the locations of facilities? Can they, can they figure other things out? That's one question I have. Another question is, if material is declared inoperable, so if you say that you, know, you have a significant quantity of plutonium or HEU for a warhead, and that you've now blended that down, is there the possibility of cheating and re-entering that as new material? Does that matter as much? You know, in other words, can you take it out of the blockchain and then re-enter it, um, um, uh, disguising its origins? Um, the third I would question I would have is, have you thought about how this interacts specifically with inspections? Because I think one way to vastly increase your confidence, you have all this distributed ledger information, you have all this. To me, that then helps me in verification because it tells me specifically where I need to look to see if there's cheating. And by having greater confidence in all of the data, finding single points of discrepancies can or non-discrepancies can give me greater faith in the whole set of information. So in a way, I think this could really bolster physical verification and regular material control and accounting as it exists in safeguards uh, or in warhead dismantlement. And that brings me to my fourth uh, point, component tracking and safeguards. So for me, the worry isn't necessarily getting a count on warheads in the active, um, stockpile because I think that's pretty clear. The, the fear is that someone's gonna flood their active stockpile with unaccounted for warheads. And so um, one way to contribute to 
confidence that this can work in nuclear disarmament verification would actually be non-nuclear weapon states using this more integrated in their national safeguard system for material. If it is shown, for instance, by a non-nuclear weapon state that uses nuclear material in um, reactors, if this gives me confidence that it is bolstering and increasing the material control and accounting of their material from cradle to grave, from, um, from fuel fabrication to reactor use to final disposition, then I would have a lot more faith that it would actually bolster arms control because then I would have faith that we could go from warheads to you know, electricity um, um, with great faith. So the non-nuclear weapon states actually, I think, would have a huge role here in demonstrating the efficacy of this for systems, for systems tracking of material. And then um, just finally on uh, your internet, internet of the things, because what I see in the end is you'd have two internets of the things that intersect, one on warheads and the other on the material derived from that warheads and the material that could be used in those warheads. And if you had full faith in those two IOTs and in any potential interaction between the material tracking and the warhead tracking, then you would have much better faith that you could actually trace whether a nation is moving towards disarmament, cheating, or building up their arsenals. So all in all, I think this is an amazing effort. I think this has a huge potential to contribute to nuclear disarmament verification. And specifically that there's a strong role that the non-nuclear weapon states and track 1.5 and track two can contribute. We at NATO have this thing called the Science and Technology Organization. And I'm definitely gonna throw all this at them because they have thousands of scientists and they wanna engage in nuclear disarmament verification. And honestly, I think, um, uh, Lyndon, this is one of the most exciting ideas I've heard in nuclear disarmament verification in a long time. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, William. Um, it's very encouraging. And, and thank you very much for your for your expert feedback and for those questions. So um, yeah, you've raised some great, some great points there and some great questions. So let me just try and run through those um, as as clearly and rapidly as I can. So on your first point about <clears throat> um, nuclear materials tracking, so HEU and plut plutonium, um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of research has been going into that specific question. So how can blockchain increase the st strengthen and increase the efficiency and effectiveness of nuclear materials and, and nuclear material control and accounting? Um, and so the three examples of that that I look at in the report um, in the United States uh, with the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory in Australia, cooperation with the University of New South Wales and uh, also in the States, um, sorry, in Finland uh, in cooperation with Stimson Center. Um, all three of those projects have actually built prototypes of various kinds to test this exact question that you raise uh, on not just how do we look at warheads or warhead parts or in the active stockpile, et cetera, but how do we deal with uh, materials and making sure that we have full confidence that they are not being diverted from, from the uh, supply chain. And all three of those uh, prototypes that were built and the tests that were done uh, reached basically the same conclusion, which was that yes, blockchain uh, has excellent potential to add um, confidence to those process, particularly because what it does is, uh, at, at present, the nuclear materials and, and it, accounting and control uh, reporting is hierarchical. So nuclear operators report up to a national regulator and that national regulator reports up to the IAEA. That process takes time, it's cumbersome, data can get lost along the way. What this does is it enables a network approach whereby uh, the operator reports to the national regulator and that is logged on a blockchain. And then the IAEA could, for example, have direct access to the blockchain. So they can just sit over it and watch everything that's happening in near enough to real time. And so what that enables is with the IAEA as the central sort of authority that's tracking these things worldwide, it can much more quickly and efficiently detect attempts to divert nuclear material. Um, now, in terms of uh, how that Works. The, the other thing that you raised is the idea of non-nuclear weapon states using blockchain to track their own national nuclear material accounting and control and how that would add confidence to, to, to nuclear weapon states in terms of being willing to reduce numbers in their stockpile, et cetera. Um, uh, there was a, uh, a I'm sorry, I don't recall offhand if it was a separate um, 
uh, Cindy will be able to answer if it, was, if it was a separate conference or if it was at the IAEA Safeguards Conference, but a session was held looking at the potential to do that. So the potential to apply blockchain to safeguards um, uh, in a variety of IAEA member states. And the conclusion of that was that there's no legal barrier to doing that. So that's a political decision. So it would, it would simply be a matter of adjusting the way that those countries interact with the IAEA. And so that is already something that, that countries could be looking into. Indeed, other countries like Argentina are already looking into that process and exploring how they can use blockchain to increase their work and safeguards. Um, in terms of your comment around, uh, sorry, I'm just going back to my notes here. Yes, okay, so you also raised a, a great question, which is, is it even though data on a blockchain is encrypted and hashed, et cetera, there is of course metadata. So where that data is coming from, the locations, the amounts of data, the regularity of that data. And so, yes, indeed. And so uh, the, the team of researchers at the U uh, University of New South Wales, working with the Australian uh, federal authorities, when they built their prototype blockchain to test this process, uh, they said, yes, it increases efficiency. Yes, it increases, potentially would increase confidence and safeguards. However, there is a risk. And that risk is exactly the point that you've raised, which is it may be that malicious actors will be able over time to look at this metadata coming into the blockchain and say, oh, here's that same shipment that happened two weeks ago. And we can correlate that with, um, we can correlate that with a political statement that was made by country X about when they got rid of a certain number of weapons. And we can determine that such and such a facility is actually the critical one. And we're going to go and attack that facility using cyber means. So, uh, Yes, that is a risk, and it's an open question, and it's something that would need a lot more um, research before it would be able to apply this to something as sensitive as a nuclear warhead component, et cetera, uh, but equally to um, uh, nuclear materials, which is the context in which that risk was flagged by those researchers at the University of New South Wales. To your question around complementarity with on-site inspections, so, Yes, there certainly is a potential for complementarity there. As I, I think I flagged at the start of the uh, presentation, I certainly hope I did, um, the uh, blockchain is a data management tool. So blockchain does not solve the problem of needing on-site inspections. It does not solve the problem of how to ensure the correctness or completeness of uh, declarations that, that countries make. Now, as I said, the, the great thing about that is that initiatives such as the International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification and the Quad Initiative of, of Norway, Sweden, the United States and the United Kingdom uh, have already for several years been doing excellent work looking at precisely those questions. So when a country at the start of a, of a verification or disarmament verification process declares, you know, say we've got 50 warheads at facility X, how on earth do we know that they're telling the truth? And so that's something the blockchain can't solve. Over time, as you said, having a mass of data in which we have confidence can add data, sorry, can add confidence to our ability to verify subsequent declarations. But at that upfront point, um, those are problems that are not, you know, blockchain is not designed to solve those problems. It's, it's a complement to the existing human level processes in place. Finally, to your to your point around uh, Internet of Things, I, I mean, I think your suggestion is excellent. I think that you know you could build an IoT, a private uh, encrypted IoT uh, with restricted um, participation to track materials, and that could do its own job of increasing confidence in the management of nuclear materials around the world, uh, and and a separate private IoT to track warheads, warhead components, delivery vehicles, etc. Um, which of course would have a lot more uh, sensitivity around it and, and therefore would need to solve some of those um, underlying uh, risk issues earlier. So I think as far as possible, I've covered off all of those things and uh, I'll turn back over to Amanda at this point. Great, gosh, this is so fascinating. I'm learning so much. I have to admit, I know zero block about blockchain entering in this, but now I know quite a bit more. So thank you and William for um, an amazing discussion and feedback. We do have some more questions for you, Lyndon, that came in the chat box. I'm also going to abuse my position of chair to sneak in one of my questions as well too. 
Um, I guess for me, and some of these questions point to it too. For me, I wonder, I know your report, you said it's not a political report. Um, or there's, you're taking the politics out of it. And I know you've talked a lot about, you know, this is a uh, blockchain as a technology that offers more of the technology as opposed to the politics, though, you know, some of the political of how to increase confidence in this technology and whatnot have been discussed between you and William. I do wonder, coming from my critical security studies background, right, if you could reflect on what else might be the politics that are involved in this because we uh, you know critical security studies will tell us that data alongside these different technologies are never neutral so I don't know if you've considered anything around that what what might critical security studies questions to this help us think more about blockchain that might be a mean question I apologize in advance for that Lyndon. Um, another question comes from Abreem, who uh, talks as two points of the question, just asking a very practical question of what will be the cost of this process. Um, and then I'm wondering, in addition to that, is who's who's going to bear the cost of this, right? Is this um, individual states that bear the cost of this? Because that, you know, um, there, there's gross inequalities around defense budgets and whatnot. So um, that's one question. Another question is um, from Emmanuel, um, thanking you for a very interesting publication and presentation and asking you if you have plans to present your work at the IPNDV um, or do you have any sense that they have interest on their side to integrate this sort of um, technology or research of this uh, on this uh, within their own work. Cindy has a few uh, comments that she's made about, I guess, the conference that you're referring to. If it's the conference was a member state acceptability one done outside of the IAEA, but in Vienna. Um, I don't know if Cindy, if you want to zoom in right now and just maybe clarify, because there was a little bit of a conversation happening there. And sure, no problem. <laughs> First of all, Lyndon, it's great to see you and congratulations on getting the paper done. Uh, it's, it's always nice to see it published. And just the Slavka report is coming out today. Um, so big news there. Yes, finally, a little three months behind, but uh, it'll be there. Um, so just on the on the conferences, we have done a uh, one on member state acceptability, uh, where we brought in regulators and, uh, of course, the, the agency, but that was a Chatham House uh, outside of the agency. And then there was the emerging tech workshop, which uh, Chris uh, had just uh, reiterated too in the chat that and that was held in January this year, the one on member state acceptability was June uh, 2019. Uh, but if I could just make a comment. Uh, Lyndon and, and, and also to, to William's uh, question on the verification aspect. So how to get the digital and the physical to, to link up. And uh, with Slavka, with the prototype that we developed, uh, there is a verification click or button, if you will. Nothing in blockchain in any way takes away from the physical inspection, on-site inspection that has to happen when it comes to safeguards. And so there you actually get that that link that happens when inspectors go on site, they can actually verify that what is on the shared ledger is indeed what they see uh, on site physically, and then they will click uh, and, and verify that. And if not, then of course you could uh, reject, uh, and then there would have to be a process. So everything is the entire history of how material moves through the supply chain is tracked. Uh, from mine to a deep geological repository. Uh, so that is uh, one of the benefits of, of DLT overall. And I don't want to take away from uh, Lyndon's thunder. So just thanks. Uh, I wanted to be here for you today, Lyndon. I'm up. You can see the sun's coming in. It's great. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much, Cindy. And I wanted to say, yeah, thanks. It's, I'm, sh I'm sure it's a disgusting time of day to be up and, and on a Zoom call there. So so thanks very much. And thanks for clarifying that. And actually, you've, you've just... Um, clarified a point that I, I perhaps didn't make clear enough previously, which is that the, the Finnish uh, prototype that you built, uh, that you, you know, in collaboration with the Finnish um, government, uh, does exactly that. It's, it's a cradle to grave tracking process. It's the first complete nuclear material fuel cycle um, uh, blockchain prototype. So congratulations on that work. And, and just, yeah, that your work has been such a help for me and you've been such a help. So thanks very much. Um, so Amanda, if, uh, maybe I could just go back to some of those questions that you flagged. Well, I'm just conscious of the time. I think I'm just going to finish the other questions and then you can just 
pick and choose which ones you want to respond to, right? Sure thing. Prioritizing mine, of course. <laughs> okay. Of so course. Um, of course. So, uh, you know, the, the remaining questions were more around um, more technical questions around how blockchain works. So one from Raphael asks, if an upgrade of the blockchain software is wished to be made by one user, I imagine a vote has to be made on the upgrade as many cryptocurrencies require to how much, if any, voting power is given to each user. Um, and then another one from Marina who says, hi, Lyndon, congrats on the great report and presentation. Given that the privacy security of this blockchain will be critical, how do we contend with the fact that when it came out, Bitcoin was thought to be completely anonymous? This is something that has come up in um, my own Maria's Marina's research on cryptocurrencies that purport to be private shield. Those are the all the questions put back at you, Lyndon. Okay, and we've got about 10 minutes till we wrap. Is that right? Okay, cool. Well, I hope to be able to race through those in 10 minutes. Cool. So thanks very much, everyone, for some great questions. Um, Amanda, of course, prioritizing your, your, your questions. So critical security studies and data management. So here's an interesting point. Um, my overarching impression of critical security studies, and please feel free to jump in and correct me, is that a lot of critical scholars tend towards a more human security approach than a traditional realist state-based approach. It's not to say that they are mutually interdependent, sorry, not to say that they're mutually independent, but that there is a lot of focus on the human body, the human experience, et cetera, in the critical studies approach. Uh, and as a result, the focus on data management and privacy is around rights issues around privacy, who owns the data, who has access to it, how does it affect human rights, how does it affect, um, you know, responsibility of the state in relation to the individual, etc. So what's interesting about this process is what I'm actually proposing here, uh, what blockchain does is it makes the enactment of responsibilities uh, automatic how, uh, automated. So it automates the enactment of responsibilities. So once an agreement is logged in a blockchain, it happens whether you like it or not. Once you've signed off on that blockchain, if certain criteria are meet and smart contracts are activated, then you get the result that you agreed on previously. So what it does is it means that there is more um, clarity and predictability for all actors. You can't just go changing the situation. So uh, to look at the example, and, and this is a roundabout way of coming to you to, to, to respond to a question. If you look at the example of a cryptocurrency like blockchain, um, the, the United States can say year after year after year, we couldn't possibly print more money because it would cause inflation and we don't want that. And then COVID comes along and it just says, right, we're printing money. We're printing money from now until the cows come home, right? So there's no ability for individual citizens to trust in the amount of monetary supply because the government can come along at any moment and just say, right, print $3 trillion. And you have no ability to control that relationship. With a blockchain, that just simply doesn't exist because in order to uh, add data to the blockchain, to make changes to the blockchain, to do whatever you want, you have to go via the consensus mechanism. And so if you jump on there with consensus mechanism and say, right, uh, the United States would like to go back to transaction number four, and we're actually removing all of that data. Uh, the rest of the network just says, well, no. And the United States is not able to make that change because they don't have consensus with the network. So what you're doing is you're creating predictability and stability uh, and confidence that no one actor can just jump in and change whatever they like because there is no overarching power to do it. That power is distributed across the network. It belongs to the entire network. Um, and so in that sense, I think it empowers individuals because you're, you're flattening the, 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 the hierarchy. But secondly, uh, and specifically in the context of nuclear disarmament, it's actually an inverted problem there, which is that it's not so much about the rights of individuals and how are we going to protect human rights and et cetera. It's that states may well be politically very cautious about committing agreements to a blockchain that they can't then undo later. So if they make commitments on a blockchain that say when X happens, we will transparently reveal Y. Um, two years down the track, when X happens, that government might be sitting there going, no, 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 we don't, we don't want to reveal why. And it's like, well, 
it's in the blockchain, you can't change it. So in that regard, politically speaking, that is one area where there may be some hesitancy among states because they're committing to that absolute, uh, you know, it's an absolute commitment, you, you can't undo it. On that basis, I'm now going to jump ahead to the last question because the two interact, which is, sorry, this, the second last question around a software upgrade. So all of these things are written into a blockchain, so you agree in advance what it's going to look like. Um, the question of how you then change the protocol, the protocol is the, the overarching uh, network algorithm that controls all the activity on the network. The question of how you then change the agreements or add new agreements requires you to rewrite the network protocol. Um, just to say, yes, that's a very complex process. The question of who would have what voting rights would be written into the protocol initially. And so again, that's an automated process. Once that's written into the protocol initially, when you come to the point where you want to change the protocol, the different network nodes, which are operated by different countries in this vision, uh, would have voting rights as apportioned by, by the network protocol. Uh, in terms of the cost of the process, uh, I would argue that blockchain would enable a reduction in the costs of verification processes precisely because you don't have to fund a centralized authority that then has to have physical premises, um, staff, staff time, et cetera. So there are upfront costs in building the blockchain and verifying the code in checking um, that it works the way it's supposed to and only works the way it's supposed to. That's all expensive computing work that involves cryptography experts and, and coders. But once you've done that, you don't then have to stand up an organization that's gonna have permanent staff and, and ongoing costs because it's all written into the blockchain. Uh, in terms of who's gonna bear the cost, that's a political decision that would be negotiated in the development before you even get to the blockchain stage that would be negotiated in the disarmament uh, negotiation phase. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, the cost of disarmament are a lot less than the cost of maintaining nuclear weapons. Um, finally, uh, sorry, not finally, but uh, Emmanuel's question about IPNDV. I would love to present this to IPNDV. Uh, I haven't yet had the chance to interact with any policymakers that are currently engaged in IPNDV, but I would certainly hope to in future. And so, uh, yeah, I'd be honoured and delighted if, if uh, that were a possibility, but nothing to report there at this point. Uh, finally, I'm just some costs. Yeah, so the final question around uh, anonymity. Um, thanks very much for that, Marina. So, yes, this goes to the issue of the metadata. So, for example, uh, in the, you know, the, the original example of a blockchain, uh, Bitcoin, there was this idea that it is anonymous, but in fact, there are ways that you can get around that. So you can track uh, IP addresses to see where certain transactions were initiated from, et cetera, et cetera. And so even though you can't see who those actors are, uh, in Bitcoin, you can see that wallet A transferred amount X to wallet B. Uh, and if you know the IP address of wallet A or wallet B or other types of metadata, over time it may be able, you may be able to infer who those people are or where they are physically, et cetera. Uh, I certainly don't have the level of technical expertise to comment on how we can get around those challenges or how we can ensure the necessary levels of security for that data and the anonymity that is required or, is, or in fact the transparency that is required to make sure that we know who's submitting data to the blockchain extremely technical issues. So I am going to kick that one to touch, as we say in the rugby world, um, and say these are all questions that are absolutely valid and important to, to clarify over time. Uh, but it's still very much early days for this. And this, this research paper is very much a conceptual one about what blockchain makes possible conceptually. So I think, I hope I've covered off all of the uh, questions there. And again, just want to thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much, William, for your fantastic feedback and for all of your help in developing this over yeah, the last 18 months or so. Um, thanks to Cindy. And, and, and also, I should have said also uh, to Grant, uh, who also very kindly read an earlier version of this paper. And thanks to very much, everyone, uh, for, for attending and for your questions. That's great, Lyndon, and true to uh, military or security precision, you ended bang on time. So um, that's fantastic. And you did kind of my closing job for me. So I think the last people I want to thank is the audience for coming and, and listening and engaging. So, and of course, echoing to, to William um, and Lyndon, to you both for, 
you know, uh, coming here amid your busy day and Cindy for waking up ridiculously early, apparently. Um, so yeah, um, stay tuned. Please come to uh, next week's uh, seminar. If you're interested, we're talking about media or women in the media um, and how we encourage female academic experts to engage more with the media and the challenges and opportunities. If you're interested, next Wednesday, same time, bring a cuppa. Otherwise, thank you very much for coming and um, hopefully I can see you soon. Take care. Thanks very much.